Distilling Ecological Design Principles. What does nature-friendly design mean and what are the principles upon which it is based? How do you include ecosystem-based thinking in your hydraulic engineering design practice? I searched for an answer to these questions because they enable the connection between ecology, environmental science and engineering design. So in this video, I'm going to distill ecological design principles as counterpoints for the engineering design principles. These principles will enable you to make the connection between the hydraulic engineering design choices you make and the choices to conserve, restore or provide opportunities for the ecosystem. That is, build with nature. Remember, we're not discussing the potential impacts of the infrastructure on the environment, nor are we evaluating the goods and services deriving to humans from an ecosystem. Instead, we're looking from the outset from an ecological perspective, how we can make design choices that accord more fully with the character and the functional integrity of the ecosystem. But what do I mean by the character and functional integrity of the ecosystem? Let me explain each of the 11 ecological principles. If each of these principles are applied fully across multiple time and space scales, the inherent character and the functional integrity of the ecosystem should be maintained. First, the principle of continuity. This relates to the continuity of water and sediment flows and land-water interfaces in the ecosystem. An ecosystem should be well connected, or it could be well connected or it could be fragmented. For instance, Dams can interrupt the continuum of a river and alter the quantity of water and the sediments available in the downstream river. Or coastal defences such as closed groins can interrupt the longshore transport of sediment, whereas an open groin system allows transport of sediment through the groin to a certain extent. Second, the principle of no direct human disturbance. This aims to minimise or prevent human disturbance effects on the ecosystem. Where direct disturbance is allowed, the health of the ecosystem may be affected. The third principle of endogeneity relates to the level of invasion of an ecosystem by exotic species. A high level of indigenous species is preferred above invasive colonisation. A good example, or actually a bad example, the zebra mussel is an invasive species in Europe and in North America, in the waters. Invasive species can limit the survival opportunities of native species. So, a hydraulic structure or its associated activities shouldn't advantage invasive species above indigenous species. Fourth, the principle of viability of populations. A species is viable when it has the ability to persist, that is, its size exceeds a critical threshold. When its size is below the threshold, the population might face extinction. An infrastructure shouldn't threat the threaten the ability of populations to persist, but instead should provide opportunities for endangered populations and particular species. This brings us to the fifth principle of providing opportunities for threatened species. Because the ability of threatened species to thrive is compromised, particular attention can be paid to creating opportunities for their survival and their restoration. Hydraulic infrastructures can help by offering, rather than denying, new habitats, restoring connectivity and improving circulation, for instance. Sixth, the principle of trophic web integrity. Ecosystems are complex networks in which matter, energy and living beings interact. A fully representative trophic web has all the levels and all the species interacting in a healthy way. When critical species, also known as keystone species, are missing, the integrity of the trophic web is harmed and the ecosystem is no longer healthy. 
For example, when urchins are missing from a coral reef environment, algae take over and smother the coral. The seventh principle is opportunity for ecological succession. Now, ecological succession is the natural change in species present, present in an ecosystem over time. For instance, pioneer plant species that grow on a newly forming dune are later replaced by secondary vegetation as the dune becomes more stable. And finally, the ecosystem achieves its climax state when tertiary vegetation, such as woodland, is fully established. According to this principle, opportunities for the process of dynamic change should be ongoing and need to be offered for each and every stage from pioneer to climax. The eighth principle of zone integrity aims to ensure that the natural mosaic of the ecosystem is fully represented. For instance, an estuarine salt marsh is characterized by a continuum from submerged mudflat to the upland zone that is only occasionally inundated. This is inundated every day. The presence of the full range of zonal diversity is a condition for ecosystem health. When one or more zones are missing, the integrity of the ecosystem is compromised. Ninth, the principle of characteristic inorganic cycles. That relates to the integrity of the throughputs of carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and silicon in an ecosystem. Inorganic and organic cycles that are fully representative function at all levels within their natural ranges, acting to support and enable ecosystem character. When the throughputs are disrupted or pushed outside their natural ranges, the character and the functioning of the ecosystem can alter. For instance, when dunes receive an excessive supply of nitrogen via air pollution, tertiary dune vegetation is overstimulated and the natural dynamic movement of sand is limited by thick vegetation. The tenth principle of characteristic physical chemical water quality aims to ensure that the natural distribution of water quality states is maintained over time and space. When water quality parameters are within their natural dynamic ranges, ecosystem functions are supported. Otherwise, atypical events can be triggered. For example, when oxygen levels become depleted, algal blooms and even fish kills can occur. The last principle is that of resilience. Ecological resilience is the capacity of the ecosystem to maintain its integrity following consecutive disturbances. So an ecosystem is considered resilient when it's able to withstand and even benefit from reasonable, foreseeable disturbances. An ecosystem is considered vulnerable when its character and functional integrity will alter after single disturbances. To recap, there are 11 ecological design principles. Continuity, no direct human disturbance, endogeneity, population viability, opportunity for threatened species, trophic web integrity, opportunity for ecological succession, zone integrity, characteristic inorganic and organic cycles, and characteristic physical chemical water quality, as well as resilience. Now that you have learned about ecological design principles, for the non-environmental scientists amongst you, did you notice it's all about conserving and restoring dynamics of ecological networks and of landscapes over time and space? And for the environmental scientists, you may not have realized that engineers can help in this endeavour, engineers can learn to design for healthy and functional ecosystems. They can apply these ecological design principles to deliver nature-friendly design. Thank you for your attention.